thank you all very much for being here. So, active threat drill, July 23rd, that's why we're here. So I'm Craig Ginn, I'm the DES Risk and Emergency Manager. Mark Rogers, WATEC Emergency Manager. Robin Thompson, the Safety and Emergency Coordinator for OFF. Okay. So, our objective, we want to raise your awareness about active threats. Understand warning signs and potential indicators. Response to active threat, the run, hide, fight. And then what to expect on July 23rd. So we'll, we'll go over how the drill is going to roll out. So what is an active threat? So any incident by its deliberate nature creates an immediate threat or presents immediate danger to the community. It's not just a gun. It could be a car, like happened in California. It could be someone walking around the office with a golf club, or a two by four, or a knife. So that's why we've gone away, Homeland Security FBI has gone away from active shooter to active threat because there's more than just weapons involved, or guns involved. But for the purpose of our training, we're going to talk about active shooter as well, because we do have a few slides provided by the FBI that talks about active shooter incidents. So, what is an active shooter? Active shooter is an individual actively <coughs> engaged in killing or attempting to kill people in a confined and populated area. In most cases, they involve guns. Well, that's an active shooter. And there is no pattern or method to their selection of victims. Active shooter situations are unpredictable and evolve quickly. On this note, so usually active shooter incidents last about five to seven minutes. Who heard about the Virginia Beach active uh, threat incident a couple of weeks ago, right? So that incident lasted 53 minutes. And you know why? So this employee put his, a letter of resignation in. His supervisor didn't do anything with it. He still had his key card. So they were building two, and in less than a minute away, law enforcement the police department was in building one. He went in with his key card, started taking out people on the first floor, then went on the second floor, <coughs> then went on the third floor, and blockaded himself into that, that room. He engaged five law enforcement officers before they could get to him and end the threat. Eleven people died, and, and then the shooter died as well, so a total of 12 people. Five law, law, five law enforcement officers were injured. So, we'll go through some other things later, but, you know, if someone resigns or terminates, take away their key card as soon as possible. So, 2016, 20 active shooter incidents. From 2017, 30, increase of 10. I did a little poll, I looked at May 20th through uh, June 5th, guess how many there were? Just off the top of your head. 10. 10? Halfway there. 21. <coughs> this year. This year. In a two week time frame. So, unfortunately this stuff is real. And that's why we're here. Raise your awareness. So by the way, 50 incidents in 21 states, 943 casualties, 221 killed, 722 wounded, 13 law enforcement officers killed, 20 law enforcement officers wounded, 20 met the mass killing definition. Now mass killing depends on what source you look at, it's three or more fatalities or four or more, so even one's too many. And then 14 incidents ended with the exchange of gunfire between shooters and law So, the most catastrophic ones, Las Vegas. Remember Las Vegas? 58 killed, 489 wounded by one person. Pulse Nightclub Orlando. Remember that one too? 49 killed, 53 wounded. And then First Baptist Church in Texas, 26 killed and 20 wounded. That is a lot. 
So about the shooter. F 50 shooters, all were male, all acted alone. But they're not always male. There's a husband and wife team in California a couple years ago. So, and, so, I mean, you can't just say it's guys, because it can be ladies. Age range, most of them were between their, their 20s and 30s. <coughs> Three of them were body armed. So I guess they expected they were going to get away. Assumption, <coughs> but maybe. 13 shooters committed suicide. 11 shooters killed by law enforcement. Eight shooters killed by citizens like us. And then 18 shooters were apprehended by law enforcement. So, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, things that you look for. Uh, about situational awareness. To put this in context, uh, does anybody know where the majority of these kinds of incidents are? Workplace. 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 Workplace.
threats and problems uh, in the past. So, as somebody in the general public, I used to work over in the Capitol building, and there would always be individuals that were, they looked like they were a potential threat, and State Patrol would take care of them. Uh, but it's really anybody that can, that can manifest this kind of behavior. So there's a whole laundry list of items here. And really, if you were in a relationship with somebody and you saw these things manifesting, you would be concerned. If you were sitting next to somebody in the office and you see these things manifesting, you might be concerned. Um, I'm not sure that active shooter, this applies terribly because it, you know, people roll in and they decide they're going to do violence and you're not going to get the opportunity to watch them. But this is here for your awareness. So, interject. So, explosive outbursts of anger or rage without provocation. So, I'll leave out that provocation. So, I'm going to throw another example out there for you. So, back in February in Illinois, a employee did a severe safety violation, and he thought he was going to get fired. So he told another colleague that if they turn at me, I'm going to come in, I'm going to kill everyone here. That employee didn't take him seriously because he was always a hothead. So the next day at that employee's termination meeting, he shot all five people in the room, killing four of them. One was an intern on the very first day. And then he went out tried to find the person that he told and shot a different person before he was taken down. So, my, what I want to leave you with, if someone says something like, I'm going to kill somebody or I'm going to hurt them or I'm going to do this, tell someone about it. Because imagine that employee, what he has to live with the rest of his life, knowing that if he would have said something, he could have saved six people. You'll notice that a lot of these things that are indicators refer to mental health situations. And so there's a training out there from a national perspective that's called Mental Health First Aid. You'll see it available across uh, the community, sometimes from community ads, sometimes churches are offering it, and employers are now offering the Mental Health First Aid training. It gives you a foundation, an understanding of how to deal with people when you might see these kind of behaviors and how to understand what's going on with them so that you can respond to them in a way that is helpful and doesn't um, escalate the situation. And to find out how to get them the kind of help they need. Because if you start noticing one little thing, you might not think it's a big deal. But that one little thing put together with a few other little things might indicate a bigger problem. And that's why we need to be thinking of this as being a source of help for people who need help. And sharing those little things that you see with the appropriate people within your organization, um, the supervisors or HR. And again, these are skills that you're going to apply in all areas of your life. So 10% at government locations, but how many people go to malls? How many people go to church? So these are skills that you would use in all areas of your life. So watch for mental health for state training and take it if it's available to you. So as, as we're talking, let somebody know, let a supervisor know. HR is another good place. They maintain confidentiality. So you can report there as well. Hopefully the supervisor will offer some support to the individual to try to help them work with the employee in any way they can. Or in some cases where there's a history, uh, law enforcement might need to be involved in some party. So, you're, you're being proactive here today. You're trying to get prepared for something like this as much as anyone can. Uh, I started out with a, a real a 
really want you to think a lot about your situational awareness. Don't walk into a room and be oblivious to the people around you. Don't, you know, you see people go down the street on their phones. Uh, gosh, that's just an invitation to trouble. Uh, and, and you really set yourself up for some people who are opportunistic. Uh, participating in this, participating in the drill on the 23rd is another good way to uh, work through in your mind how you would react and we'll try to provide enough stress that you'll, you'll have to stop, think, and act. Know your evacuation routes. So everybody comes and goes, you know, we're kind of creatures. We follow the same paths in and out every day. Take a different path. We've got published routes in the building for exits. Every day or, or maybe every week select a different route and use that so that you become really familiar with that route. What to expect, which way the doors open, you know, all those things. How many corners you've got, that kind of thing. Um, concealment rooms. We have concealment rooms in the facility. You'll recognize them by uh, conference rooms with blinds on them, that sort of thing. There's little kick down stops on the inside of the door. Shut the door, kick it down, drop the blind. You know, now you're concealed. The bad guy can't see you, so he can't target you. The idea is to stay out of sight. So it's not going to stop bullets, but if he doesn't know where to shoot, he's going to move on to other targets. So learn where those concealment rooms are on your floor or any other floor that you happen to uh, visit. And like I said, situational awareness is key. That you, can, you can avoid a lot of problems. And the message here is avoid if you can. And of course, there's always policies and procedures, things that you can familiarize yourself with. Now there's another uh, thing that we can recommend, and that is to sign up in, with Gov Delivery. It is not an alerted warning system. It is not all that timely, but it's what we have. If there's something going on across the campus, and you're here, you may get an email or a text. And, you know, you, you, it's self-subscription, so you put in the mode of communication that you want to receive information on. You may get a notice before the event is all over so that you're not trucking across the campus to a meeting or something of that sort of walk right into the middle of something so i would recommend that you sign up for that we do have an effort underway among the, the tenant agencies here at 1500 and right Renstead to look into a decent alert warning system that would that is actually a purpose built so that you get rapid uh, dissemination of information in multiple modes. So in, in these events, the State Patrol is going to be the organization that's responding. They're going to be in charge. They're going to also control messages coming out. I don't know how many of you have been in emergency situations or I worked up at the up at Camp Murray in the State Emergency Operations Center, and you get communications from the field where people are out there, their lives are on the line, they're fighting wildland fires, doing other things. Communications are imperfect early on in these things. You're going to get imperfect information. Some of it's going to be flat wrong, but that's just the way it is. And so you have to deal with what's in front of you. So. In these situations, state patrol may order uh, restricted access to the buildings. There are certain people in this facility that have the authority to do that as well. And records that knows who they are. The other thing you want to be aware of is that there are dependence, there are differences in the buildings on the campus. So some have different lockdown procedures, some have different, well, everything, for that matter, and, and location of uh, rooms to hide in. So wherever you happen to go frequently, it would be prudent to learn as much about that facility as you possibly can. So lockdowns get ordered whenever there's a threat. 
uh, Tim Yu. Uh, the whole idea is to protect uh, all of us from the facility. And so we do that by securing the building, and there's a couple of ways that we do that. All your entries and exits. Oh, one more thing I want to mention. When there is a lockdown, uh, don't put yourself in the middle of the action. So out in Tumwater, there was an incident, um, it's been several months ago now, maybe it was last year, yeah. Uh, where, has it been that long? <laughs> How time flies. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, this guy had come in and decided that he didn't like his wife's car and he was just going to beat it into a million pieces. And so law enforcement responded and he was pretty upset and they were trying to defuse things and it wasn't going well. Unfortunately, there were people with windows watching this whole thing play out. What they didn't realize is that if law enforcement had to use a sidearm, that some of those people were right in line with where they were going to shoot. So law enforcement then lost the ability to use that weapon, so they had to they used a beanbag gun. And those things, it's a beanbag fired out of a 12 gauge shotgun. And it took, what, 14? No, 14 to bring this guy down because he was so totally out of control. So the word I guess the recommendation is don't become a part of the uh, disaster. You have a choice. Stay away from the windows, stay away from the doors, let things happen. And don't become desensitized, because even though it was two years ago, we just got word today that he's out. He did not show up to a CO appointment, and he cut off his ankle bracelet. So um, we're on high alert over there again. Okay. After two years. Thank you for Still ongoing. Yeah, did everyone hear that? No. No. Yeah. <coughs> <laughs> just that not to get desensitized because even though that was over two years ago we just got word today that he did not show up to a CO appointment and he cut off his ankle bracelet so he is we are on high alert over there in Tumwater that he could show up again yeah this is real and you know you're here to learn some things and hopefully those things will serve you no matter where you go, but what you're learning might just save your life. <coughs> it really did, you know, it really matters. It's, it's a big deal. Okay, so on the campus, uh, campus community has defined different types of lockdowns. They serve different purposes. The first one, uh, normal operations, okay, we badge in and out, no problem, everything's working normal. The next one is public access restricted, so working in the legislative building and the insurance building, a, a lot of, you know, for 15 years, you would see lots of people doing lots of things. And there were times when it was just prudent to make sure that they didn't get into the facility because they were, oftentimes didn't have your best interest in mind. And so that's what public access restricted means. There's something outside that's a problem. We're going to let everybody that's supposed to be here in. The badge continues to work. Generally, things are pretty normal. Um, be careful. Be mindful. Again, situational awareness. The next one is all access restricted. So that's a situation where <clears throat> you don't want to be here at all. We're, we're saying if you're in the building, we recommend you stay here, shelter in place, stay away from the windows. If you're outside and you approach the building and this condition is in force, there will be signs posted eventually, one of these years, not before I retire, but one of these years, tomorrow, I, well, I, I keep hoping. <laughs> um, that will have some kind of a system that will let you understand the threat before, long before you get close to the building so that you can deviate and go someplace else. The thing is, don't come to the building, don't try your card, don't stand there and talk with other people and commiserate because now you are a nice group of targets. Easy pickings. Get your car, go away, or walk away. But get away from this area. That's that's the whole thing right there. The whole idea is that you put distance between you and the threat. 
as much distance as you can get, the better off you are, especially if there are big things between you and, and the threat like a concrete building. Then there's a lockdown. That's the last one. Now, we don't do this kind of lockdown in this facility, but other buildings on the campus may. And what that means is that not only are the perimeter doors locked, but some interior doors are locked as well. We opted not to do that, hoping that we wouldn't lock you in with the threat or prevent you from getting from where you are to a place to shelter. So you have freedom inside the building, just you can't get back in if you leave. We won't restrict you from leaving. Uh, that would be kind of like kidnapping. But uh, we would strongly advise you to not go where the bad bad guys are. So, how are you going to know that there's something happening? Well, like I mentioned, if it's over near the Capitol, you know, where they have all the good demonstrations and crowds and all that fun stuff, uh, you might get uh, an email through Gov Delivery. That would be a good way to uh, get a heads up. Inside the building, though, if something happens in here, probably the first thing you're going to hear are gunshots, screaming, uh, a stampede to get out, you can hear people run. You might actually confront the threat. That would be <clears throat> that would be a tough space to be in to learn about it, unless you see it from the back and you can, you know, move out of the line of fire. Now, how many people are going to stop and send you an email when there's a <laughs> Yeah, email, not so much. But hey, we have to let you know. There could be somebody that's really diligent. They run out the door and they, you know, they get their eyes open and they're sending an email. OK. So Mark just reminded you of how you would probably hear if there is a threat in your area. These things happen quickly. We can have all of the warning devices that we want, but even if we have the highest technology, it's the decisions that you make immediately that are going to make the difference, that are going to protect yourself. And hopefully you've all heard of run, hide, fight, and it's become kind of a mantra. This is the standard across the nation and, and across the world in how we need to respond. Run, hide, fight. Run, hide, fight. It becomes a mantra. But if you get so stuck into the mantra, sometimes you forget to think. So we're going to interject here some of the things that you need to think about. Now, it's, it's established in the order that you're most likely to survive. Run. You always want to run, if at all possible. So what are some of the things you're thinking about when it's time to run, when you've decided there's a threat, it's dangerous, I need to leave. What are some of the things you're thinking about in running? Won't be the last one out the door. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Don't run into the threat. Okay, don't be the last one out, don't run into the threat. And that is because we are going to be last and we're not going to slow down for somebody else. And if you have an escape route in mind, it's really great. You need to have multiple escape groups because your primary escape group might take you in front of the threat. So don't get so stuck in knowing that one route, as Mark suggested, know several routes. And be aware of where the sounds are coming from, if you can see any indicators, people running in a particular direction, so that you can choose your best route. Um, don't draw attention to yourself, don't be screaming, don't let the threat know where you are. And if this is a hard one for people, if somebody's wounded, you can't stop to help them. And this is a really hard, hard situation people find themselves in. But you need to get yourself to safety so that the um, people who need to help those people will be coming in. Don't run back to your desk to get important things. But think about it every day. Do you have important things with you? I always have my keys with me. They don't stay in my coat pocket. They don't stay in my purse. Because if this happens in your building, it's going to become a crime scene, and you might not get back to your desk for weeks. So think about every day when you leave your desk, you have important things with you, the keys, your cell phone, the things that you might need to leave if you need to leave immediately. When you're safe, we want you to call 911, but don't stop to do that in the building. Get out, 
get away. And when you're safely outside, warn those other people from coming in so that they aren't coming in. And we're going to look at the map where our assembly area is. So if you are deciding to run, we want you to get as far away from this place where you feel safe. We have an assembly area um, designated that we want you to go to. And when you're thinking about going to the assembly area, you want to be thinking about those hazards along the way. So this is over here between the transportation building and security, uh, economic security. What are some hazards? Yes? Right now they've got construction going on. Exactly. <laughs> right. But there are some areas there, and there are some areas identified for handicap access through there. So right now, today, you know that that's a hazard. So maybe at lunch you want to walk over there and get familiar with the way it is right now. Also, um, if you are leaving here and you're running to take shelter, the people out there in the world might not know that this is going on. So there's going to be regular traffic and there's going to be law enforcement vehicles arriving. So just watch for traffic and be aware of your surroundings. Wrong button. Okay. So, run. Always run at the all possible. That's the best way to survive. But if you are looking at your route to get out and the threat is in your way, then you might have to hide. And so we want to think about some of those things about hiding that you want to think about. Staying out of the view of the threat so they don't see you. Taking shelter where you can't be seen. Now some people think just immediately diving under their desk is getting out of view. But then you are trapped there and you don't have shelter in front of you. You're hiding, but you're not sheltered. So knowing where the concealment rooms or things that you can do to make a concealment room from any room that you're in. You want to lock the door. We have the kick down door stops in the conference rooms that have been identified and the offices that have been identified as concealment rooms. But you sometimes have a room that has a lock on it. There's a few rooms in the building that have uh, five rooms that have access. Some people have access to those. And then you want to put something they're uh, between you and the door. Even if you get the door locked, the shades down, use things to block the door, put things between you and that door, take um, shelter behind pieces of furniture so that you have as many layers of protection between you and where the threat would come from. You want to not have a noise that's going to attract the threat, so turning off your cell phone, making the um, room quiet if there's other sources of noise in there. You want to try and remain quiet and calm, and if you're sheltering with other people, there might be people who aren't remaining quiet and calm. If you watch the Run, Hide, Fight video that was available, there's sometimes a need to help other people who are having a hard time and, and give them some uh, assistance to remain quiet and calm. If you can call 911 where you are, um, and you want to be able to do that, go ahead, but you might not want to be talking because we told you to stay quiet. So maybe you can text to 911. Here in Thurston County, many of the counties, you can do text to 911. So if you're in a different county, you might want to check with your local county whether texting to 911 is possible. And even if you are calling and you don't want to talk, if you just call and leave the um, phone open, the dispatchers are going to hear, they're trained to pick up clues. Um, so you can call and, and just leave the phone laying there to pick up the noises for the dispatcher. Then, if you're hiding, you're starting to think about fighting because you might not be hidden well enough, you might have to fight. So as you are starting um, to think about fighting, you want to think about what's going to happen. And let's talk about the concealment rooms and then we'll talk about weapons. We've identified concealment rooms in the, the plans for this building. And the, the word concealment means it gives you a place to hide, but it's a, not a total shelter. So that's why we gave you some additional steps to take to make the hiding place even more secure with putting more barriers between you and where that threat might come from. Do you know where those locations of this concealment rooms are in your immediate area and those areas where you spend a lot of time? And can you look at the room that you're in and find things within that room to make it a safe place? Uh, when you are in that room, stay away from that access point that that threat might come into, back and around and away from the, uh, the door, the entry that they might come from, and look 
be in your active threat plan and find those locations of those concealment rooms in your plan. Okay, fighting. How are you going to be ready for fighting? It's the last resort. You have to take this seriously. If you're in this situation, whether it's here at work or wherever you might find yourself in this situation, if you haven't been able to run, if you're hiding and you don't know if the threat is done yet, you have to be ready that the next step might be fighting and this is your last chance to save your life when they come in. So there's no hesitation. You are making decisions as a group, whoever you are hiding with, how you're going to work together and how you are going to approach the situation. And things that you can use for weapons. Why would we throw something at a person? A distraction. So that's part of what you can talk about as a group. I'm going to throw this, the other person has a weapon. So let's talk, talk about what kind of things we might use for weapons. What do you think? Well, it's all it's on the table in the conference room. Okay, that's something you can throw, right? Yep. What are some common things that are safety items that we use when there's a fire? A fire extinguisher. So how could you use a fire extinguisher as a weapon? <coughs> Spray it. Yeah. So uh, I used to uh, work with a, a colleague at the military department. Here's the, the directions that he gave for the fire extinguisher. Spray them until the, the canister is empty, and then bonk them till the twitching stops. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> right? And then it becomes the blunt object. We talk about using a cart to shove in front of them, or, or a chair on wheels. Anything that distracts them and gets their directions, um, their attention turned to another direction, gives you an in. And then maybe somebody's going to jump on it. And um, you've got sharp things that you could stab them and hurt them. Even if you can't kill them, if you're going to distract them. You're going to give them something else to be paying attention to so that you can use the other things. Where's the closest fire extinguisher here in this room? There is a huge man in this building. This back there, he's going to save us all. He has the fire extinguisher. So. Because I don't think there is anywhere else in this building. Yeah, there are. There are the restrooms. The right part where you go out the fire rooms. Yeah. So we have fire extinguishers in, in around the village, so you might want to know where those are, not just because of the fire. And then um, potentially to grab their weapon and disarm them and um, get the situation under control. And this is street fighting. Remember, this is your last chance to save your life. So whatever you have to do, that you're going to think about how you can survive the situation. So the 911 operator or law enforcement officers or people that you interact with, the uh, emergency services is going to want information from you to help to uh, give good information to the law enforcement officers that are coming to the scene. So they're going to ask you all kinds of questions. Probably a lot of them you can't tell them, but give them the information that you can. And um, they're going to go through a whole series of questions for you. And sometimes they're just going to stay on the line with you so you feel comfortable that you have somebody there talking to you. Law enforcement's going to arrive. How are you going to feel when law enforcement arrives? Relieved. Happy. You might have lots you want to tell them. You might want to express that. But they don't want to hear what you have to say right away. We're going to go through some of those things. Washington State Patrol is our primary law enforcement service here on the Capitol campus, but in these situations we're going to see support from all around, as you might see a number of different law enforcement uniforms coming through the door. Um, their first job is to find the threat and stop the threat. And so their first job is not, again, to help any of the injured. Their first job is not to get you out of there. And they have a plan that they're going to follow. So they don't need anybody interrupting them or interfering with that plan. They're going to walk right past those injured people and the people who are sheltering. And even when they have the threat, the obvious threat stop, the next step in their process is to make sure the entire scene is secure. So they have to go through a whole process before they go into the rescuing phase. So follow their directions. And once they have the scene secured, 
Then they will move into that next phase. And definitely don't follow them around in live screen. Just a suggestion. <laughs> So here's some warning things that will help you to be in that situation. Keep your hands visible, of course. You don't want to look like you might be hiding anything from them. And if you don't have anything in your hands, and they can see your hands. Stay calm and listen to what they tell you and do what they tell you. Don't move quickly. They'll tell you when to move and where to move. So don't make any quick movements in there when they're there trying to do their job. Don't be pointing and screaming and telling them, oh, that guy went that way, unless they ask you. If they ask you for information, respond to it. But don't be offering it until they ask you. They're focusing on what they're trying to accomplish, and any added information is a distraction. They're well prepared to just ignore you, so they will ignore you. Um, and if they tell you to go a certain direction, go where they tell you. If you know for sure that the shooter went that direction, of course you might want to speak up, but they're not going to be telling you until they've neutralized it. So, um, And go where they tell you to wait. So they might tell you to wait in one area and then move you again to another area. And, and Mark mentioned we, we don't need to provide any documentation or um, source of media um, pictures and streaming in these situations. They will bring services to you if you need it in the waiting area. And there might be a range of first responders providing information to you, law enforcement, fire, EMS. They're all working as a team. So once we get into the, the phase where we're getting people sifted out and care delivered, there could be a number of different um, sources of information coming to you. You may need to be searched, and of course we've had situations where the shooter has left the weapon and kind of melded into the people left. That happened um, in the Parkland School shooting, and they had to apprehend the shooter later. So you might need to be searched to make sure you're not part of the problem. Um, and we've seen this when we've uh, seen the video of uh, these situations, people evacuating with maybe their hands on their head, their hands up, or their hands on the shoulders of people in front of them. Follow the directions of instruct uh, the uh, law enforcement officers. They will tell you what they want you to do. And then they will escort you from the building. They may move you to their own chosen assembly area, or they may tell you to go to your regular assembly area. So again, pay attention because we have an assembly area, but that might not be where they want you to go. Once law enforcement is here, they're the ones who are going to tell you where to wait. So we're going to talk about the injured being treated, and I'm going to pass the uh, clicker to Craig, but I want to identify a course called Stop the Bleed. You may have heard of it. It's again another national effort developed because of these kind of incidences where citizens are being trained how do you stop the bleed kits. Stop the bleed kits are often being um, hung in public spaces with the AEDs. And just like AEDs are how citizens can help save lives, stop the bleed kits make it possible for citizens to help people survive a major bleed. So stop the bleed training short, hour and a half to two hours, teaches you how to identify a life-threatening bleed, and teaches you how to use those resources in the stop the bleed kit to do that. Um, there's packing material, and there's a tourniquet in there, and you are trained how to use those pieces. So if you see Stop the Bleed training available, please take it. And we are working to get some Stop the Bleed training started for uh, the agencies here on Capitol Campus. So you should see that becoming available soon. So, treating EMS will treat and evacuate the injured once the threat is over. But you may be asked to help as well. There could be too many casualties, injuries, that, that EMS can uh, treat. So, so they might ask you, hey, can you help me carry this person out? Or do you have first aid training? You know, do you have kids? So you may be asked to help in this situation. So when does recovery begin? When the threat is no longer a threat. And law enforcement deems it's no longer a threat. So law enforcement is an incident commander. They determine that the incident has ended and is unlikely to reoccur again. As Robin was saying, they'll go in, they'll neutralize the threat, they'll make that second sweep, unlikely to occur, threat's over, recovery begins. So there's going to be notifications going out to everybody, but it's got to be a crafted message. So we have 
four agencies in here, we have property management, and we have a cafe. So all that messaging needs to be consistent between all these partners within the building. So we're going to be addressing victims and families. So we've got to be very careful about what we're saying in these messages as well. Because law enforcement may have a lot, a lot of information that they don't want to release. So specialized, unified messaging will go out to these intended parties. So, right, internal and external communication. So, there's going to be media all over this place. It's going to be swarming with media. So, we're going to put them in a special area. I'll talk about that in a minute. But the information that we provide them is probably going to be different than information that we provide you. Because you are our, our most precious resource, and we need to make sure that you know everything that's going on. Because your families want to know, your friends are going to know, because a lot of them know that you work in this building. So determine business operations. This is going to be a crime scene. We have hundreds of lines of business that would support between these four agencies. How are we going to prioritize which ones we get back online first? That's going to be a very tough decision, especially if you can't access this building. So what do you expect? If you witness an incident, notify law enforcement. But don't do it one when they're responding. When you're leaving, say, I saw something. There's grass over here, or he entered over here, or whatever. Or they, I should say. Because it could be loose. So say after the after the response phase is done, the recovery begins. Information released to media and stakeholders. Like I said, there's gonna be a lot of information out there. But we want to make it very, very concise and uniform. Like I said, you may not be able to re-enter the building. It's a crime scene. It could be several days. It could be weeks. Now, there may be staff that are so traumatized by this incident that they never want to come back to this building again. How are you going to help them? Where are you going to relocate? Where are they going to work? So these are things that have to be thought about. So accountability. We want to know where you're at. If you grow up and you end up in Eatville, you know, that's great. But let your supervisor, your colleague, someone know where you're at. Because, you know, if we, if we don't know where you're at and we can't account for you, then we may think that you're the casualty. So accountability is really, really big. Medical care, you know, some may have to go to the hospital. You know, we want to know what ambulance they went in, what hospital they're going to. So all these things have to be uh, taken, taken to mind. Interviewing, you know, like we said, you know, if you know something, a lot of people want to interview you and counseling. A lot of this is going to be very traumatic. So there could be counseling services going on for years. Like Virginia Tech, there's still people receiving counseling from that instance. Additional similar areas. So, like I said, law enforcement is going to be all over this place. So, if they're out here responding, where are we going to put medical? Maybe we got to put them in the back. You know, where are we going to put the media? Maybe we want to put them over an OB2 auditorium because we want them to be close to the scene or take pictures of, of employees coming out or, or, or the fatalities coming out, injuries coming out. So things to think of family reunification. You know, we're not going to be doing it here. Maybe we have to do it in the Health and Sovereign's Conference Room, or maybe St. Martin. So where do we have to look at where we're going to put all these different uh, places that we're going to help our staff and their families. So, upcoming drill, July 23rd. So we're going to talk about logistics, what it'll look like, participation, external participants, Age room messaging and opting out. So, what's it going to look like? So, July 23rd, it's going to be an all day drill for the controller, the evaluators, and the observers. It will not be an all day drill for you. Each floor is going to take between 45 and 55 minutes. Mainly that's because of the QA that happens after, during the debrief. But it's only going to be 45, 55 minutes for, for your floor. I will tell you this, though. If you're on the third floor, 
you're talking to finance, and then you're like, and the drill goes off, you're going to be doing that drill of finance. You go back to your, your floor on, on six, and then we come up, well, you're going to be doing another drill. <laughs> so multiple, multiple opportunities to uh, really have to sink in. But how is this drill going to start? So what are the things that we got from the debriefs and the after action that we did for our last drill? How many were part of that drill we did two years ago? Excellent. A lot of them. So one of the things that came out of it was a very consistent sound. Not Craig walking around with kickboxing pads, hitting every 10, 15 feet going down the room, and if I couldn't even move my arms for the next seven days. That's <laughs> So consistency. Loud and consistent. So what are we going to use this year? And be mindful. This is loud. Oh, <laughs> so that's going to be very consistent. It's going to be loud enough for people to hear. And you'll know that the drill has started. Now this is going to go up three or four times on your floor. So everyone can, can know what it sounds like. So, if you listen to it, choose your run high fight. I'm not going to tell you which door or entry or run, the way we're going to be coming in at. But that's what's going to happen. So the drill starts. Observers and controllers will go to their, their stations. We'll have someone stationed at the elevator. So if anyone comes up the elevator onto that floor, we can inform them, okay, there's an active threat drill going on right now. Please stay with me. Or run. <laughs> Don't run. Walking. Don't run. No running on drill day. Just walking purposely where you wouldn't exit if you choose to run. Because we don't want you falling and getting hurt um, on drill day. Question? Well, the problem I had is when I popped up to run or get away, I saw another person who was actually a, the observer there, and I didn't know that they were an observer. So. Is there going to be... There's only going to be one threat, and that's me. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, we will have... There, there will be messaging going out, several more messaging going out, that says, control and observers will be in best. The threat is me. So, your options run high fight. Please don't fight me. This is what fight looks like. Fight. There, no, that's like No touch. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but Robert brings up a good point. What does fight look like? So, if, if, if I'm in your immediate area, fight. And I'll say, okay, you fought. Please say where you're at. And we'll continue down the floor. So, it takes about four minutes to sweep the floor with an air horn. And so you have that amount of time to identify that the threat's there or in close proximity or on the other side of the building on your floor. So you make you make a choice, you run high climb. So once we do that, and we complete the sweep of the floor, then we'll use a megaphone. And I'll walk, say, the drill is now complete. Please go to the presentation room for the deeper. So, when you're running, do you just go to the presentation yes. room immediately? Yep. When you walk briskly, <laughs> you'll come immediately to the presentation. Now, if you go down the stairwell, you have to go outside, just come in. If you take the stairwell, just come down. Do not use the elevator. But just go down the stairwell and come to the presentation. If you're hiding, so it's a lot of people go, oh, if I'm hiding, how do I know that it's safe? Well, in the, the real event, real incident, you, it may be law enforcement come and put their badge or their card. So they do have like cards that say, a, like a status card they throw under there. But for this drill, it's going to be me on a megaphone and say, the drill is now complete. Please move it to the presentation room. That's everyone in a hiding position and everyone that, that chose to fight. So coming back down to the presentation room, depending on what floor you're on, it could be two minutes, it could be ten minutes. Hopefully we got them outside faster than that today. But it depends on what's on your floor. So that's why we get 45, 55 minutes. So once we come down here for the debrief, 
we're going we're gonna to start asking some questions. If you chose to run, how, how was that? How did you feel? Did you, did you use your, your known evacuation routes? Was the stairwell crowded? So we'll, we'll ask you some, some loaded questions. Same thing with height. Did, did you find a concealment room? Did you let someone else in that concealment room once you were in there? So we'll ask you that. I mean, did you, did you take a weapon in there with you and did you formulate a plan in case the threat came in there? And they'll ask you the same thing with, with fight. If you chose to fight, how close was the threat to you when, when you fought? What weapon did you use? So we'll ask you things like that. We'll ask you what can be improved. We'll ask you what can be sustained. What went well? So questions like that. You know, and what challenges did you have, if any? So we'll facilitate those questions and then we'll open up to you. And you can you can throw out anything that, that you want to say about it. And because we want to approve for the next one. Our goal is to do these annually. So expect the manager. We do fire drills twice, unless someone burns top quarter on, on the third floor. <laughs> I know it's some of my answers. <laughs> There are people who aren't attending this training and who may not participate in the exercise because this is a really stressful topic for them. So um, there are, is the possibility of not participating in the exercise. If you feel like you cannot participate in the exercise, you need to communicate with your supervisor and with the um, exercise planner who represents your agency. So DES with Craig, OFM with me, and um, it'd be, it'd be, uh, Watek HR. So there have been a few people that have already come and said, you know, I don't think that I can participate in this drill, and we've accommodated them. We don't ask them any special circumstances of why. We said, okay, well, let's come up with a plan. I mean, so room 2320 is reserved all day long. So you can take your work in there and work. Um, you can work something out with the supervisor where you take an early lunch or a late lunch. Or, you know, you may just want to telework at it. So. We're not going to tell you what time the exercise is going to be on your floor unless you're the person who comes and says, I can't participate. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to know, and we're not going in any order. It's going to be random. So you're going to have to be ready all day long. And once it happens, then you know you're done. You can relax. Okay. And we will have the external partner, so Safe Patrol, said that they will be here for the drill. Last time they were only here for one floor of the Manly, but I was told that they'll be here all day for the drill. So that's nice. nice. EAP will not be on site this time, but if you need the information, go to eap.wa.gov. All the information is there, all the resources, and they'll help you before, after, not during, because that's going to be fast moving a bit, but before and, and after. So are you guys thinking about what you're going to do when you get back to your work area to prepare for this exercise, to prepare for these situations? What are you thinking? What are you going to do? Look around for weapons. Find a weapon. All right. Where to hide. Find that where to hide. Know where those concealment rooms are. Yeah. And there's people who aren't attending the training because maybe they're too busy. So in your work area, share the information that you've learned here. Make sure people know about the Run, Hide, Fight video. The original organization that created the Run, Hide, Fight video is Ready Houston. So if you go to their YouTube channel, Ready Houston has this video in a number of different languages too. So share that information with people who don't have English as their first language. They might um, have the language that would be more comfortable for them so they understand what the training says. Any questions? And also, this session is being recorded. So this is our very last session. This is the last of seven sessions that we've held. So we've had approximately 425 people attend this training, but with over 900 employees in this building, not everyone got a chance. So share, share what you've learned today with your small groups, with your programs, with your divisions, and let them know that this will be available on LMS probably next week. So if they, if they didn't have the chance like you guys did to attend it, Please share that information with them as well. There will be a communication going out to the agency to say that this is available LMS for training, but it does provide them an opportunity to ask questions. But we're always available except for Mark. 
something that's available for um, the first aid kits to be augmented. Uh, the expectation is when you supply equipment, you need to make sure training is there for the equipment. So you probably won't see them until the training becomes available. And But you will see stop the lead kits in public places. So, yes? The first aid kits that are in the history are those checked regularly to see if those are so valid. Well, that's how I love some of those menus, like soda or brittle. Yeah, um, the, the first aid kits are maintained by the agency, so probably check with who represents the uh, safety for your agency and ask about the first aid kits. Walt well, Safety Officer in HR takes care of that. Okay. They were just, actually, they were just reviewed not long ago, I think. Contacts were identified for some of the agencies, but not for all of them. Is there a list of contacts for all of the agencies in the building? Like DCYF wasn't mentioned. So, uh, G Sims. So, uh, the communication that went out was contact. So, there's an EM, there's a DCYF EM uh, email address, I guess. So, I'll see if I can't talk to your comm department, see if they can't send that out again. Thank you. Yeah, I think DCYF received the original notice about the training, mm -hmm. so that contact would be in that, that email that you received originally through. Okay. You see no elevators in your right line? How long do you want to wait? <laughs> <laughs> what about people that you use this year? That's a good for that. Yeah, absolutely, because you want to get out as quickly as possible. Like Mark said, you hit it. You're on the fourth floor, elevator on the first floor. Right. And it dings and he goes, oh, turn it. But, you know, everybody, the, the thing about Run Tight Fight is you are making the best decision for yourself. And so if you're standing there, the sound happens, the door opens, that might feel like the best decision for yourself. You make the decision that's best for yourself. <clears throat> yes? People in wheelchairs. Excuse me? We've got people in wheelchairs on the floor. <laughs> Have you taken into consideration what they should be? So that would be the, the, the small group plan, the energy plan, is if they know that they're going to take a little bit while longer, maybe team up, have a buddy system. So you, someone can provide them assistance to get it to consumer room. Or, but let them request. If you parked in the garage downstairs, is that considered part of the crime scene? It depends. <laughs> I hope not. I hope not. The people who are making those decisions will be law enforcement. I know. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. You had mentioned a status card in a real event. Yeah, so, so some law enforcement agencies do have a status card. It says, I am law enforcement. This is my business. Why I am. And they put it under the door? They put it under the door. Okay. Oh, nice. I see it. They're usually more, in my experience. I don't know if I trust them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Do you let people in if they're knocking or not? Like, what's your recommendation? Okay, well, that's a personal choice. But if you get 10 people in there with you, it's, I bet 10 people don't want that person coming in. Mm -hmm. Because it could be the threat coming up with your, one of your coworkers and saying, you know what, you need to let, let me in, let me in. And then you let that threat in with you. So, personally, 
I like you all. But if I'm in that room and you come a knocking, go find another one. I knew when we did it two years ago, there was a lot of that. Like people were grabbing, which coming and closing in, and like, oh, wait, find the next one. So there were a lot of like, sorry, not here. Good luck. <laughs> well, and maybe too many people were trying to conceal and not have were running. But the, um, <laughs> running is the most likely way to survive. Always, 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 if you can run, run. Get out of here. So on, on that, a lot of the folks that were going, the, People are coming out of so that you were coming out of the elevator, and the space was all the people who were literally right by the elevator. So if you ran, you had to run. That's why I was saying you had to run into the active shooter. So you were kind of blocked the way that the structure was because the only exits had to go past the active shooter. Yeah, and last time, this is a lesson learned as well. Is we announced the drill was getting ready to start on the floor. And so people were already running to a concealment rim and hiking. <laughs> 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 so, uh, and so we learned that, you know, we're going to come off the floor, have a very distinctive sound. I'm not going to go again. We were changing up a little bit because we want more value for the, for the drill. It was the Let's go. Here she comes. That, that drill was, can you find a concealment rule? The real drill has to be, can you make the right decision with what's in front of you? So, like, because of this drill, not the real thing, but, like, how soon do you lock that concealment room down? Because if I don't, if I have a ballet, I'm not going to run, and I try to get to the concealment room, but if somebody's right across from there, they might lock it, they might lock it down in five seconds and can't get in. Well, is there, like, how long you keep it open before you lock it? And, again, that's the individual thing. But if you hear the threats right down the hall, and you have a chance to run, run. But if it's right down the hall, and three or four, you can get in there real quick. Uh, put the, the blinds down, put the kick stop down, <coughs> the conference table over in front of the door, and you can do that before the threat gets to you, all, all the better. But it's... I mean, if one person's going to take that up and lock it and say it's mine, yeah. and go here, that's move on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, that's, that's the way it happens. I guess the drill going to affect the training center? No. So the training center and the conference center is not participating. The SDC is not participating on that day. I don't know what that is. State data center. None of the public areas will be involved. But we will have signage all over this place. Every every entrance will say there's an active threat drill going on this uh, today. There's going to be a charity sure party seen it on the on the elevator and the floor television monitors. That's an active threat drill July 23rd. We want you to be very very aware that this is coming. The RP meeting is scheduled on the day to make sure people who are coming from outside the building realize that there is a drill going on that day. And so, some staff bring their infants into the workplace. So, this might damage their little ears. So, that might be a consideration. You know, maybe they want to bring earmuffs for them. Or maybe they want to opt out for that, that day. So if you have those employees that bring their kids to the workplace, discuss the, that option with them. Because, I mean, if it happens in real life and they bring their kids to the workplace, they might need to know how to react as well. So it's one of those things to, to think about. And it's brought up, and I'll use like the or fire evacuation. The alarms are really loud, right? <laughs> Yes, so one of the mothers that brought their infants to the workplace, she had earmuffs sitting there for her, for her. And we did a fire alarm right there on it. Oh, what anyway? Because she wanted to practice like it was real life. So have a plan. Work with your groups about what your plan might or will look like. And as always, if you need help, if you have questions, we're always available. 
Except for Mark. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> and this again is information that's important wherever you are. And you're more likely to need these skills in other places than at work. And we all know our kids at school are learning this. They're probably better prepared than we are for these situations. Are there any other questions? Okay, the sign who roster is made about halfway down. So if those that did not sign, I know there's a couple people that came in a little, little late. So please sign in. Everyone else, thank you very, very much for your participation.